Welcome to our special edition of Clear Picture Financial. I'm your host, Jason Noble. And with me today is my esteemed colleague out of Springfield, Missouri, Katie Randall. Her and I have done so many projects here at Prime Capital Investment Advisors. We're going to talk about some of them in this conversation today. But this conversation is going to be focused around an important topic, women and wealth. Katie, thank you so much. Welcome to the show. Thanks, Jason. It's a pleasure. It's fun to finally do something um, recorded. We've had so many <laughs> behind the scenes conversations over the last year. We're going to take those behind the scenes and we're going to bring it right to the forefront. I love what you're doing with social media and just your authenticity, uh, being in the car at times and just talking. <laughs> I love it, Katie, but we're going to have a fun conversation today and an important conversation. But one of the things that we were talking about off air was the importance of women and wealth. You know, you have such a strong passion for this, Katie, mm -hmm. share that passion with me, why this is such an important topic for you. Yeah, helping women with their wealth and financial well-being is a really uh, a big passion of mine, but it's really born out of the fact that, you know, being one of the only women when I first started in this business, I always found myself being one of the only women on my team. And uh, luckily, that's changed a little bit, but I find that the statistics around female advisors really haven't changed a whole lot since I joined the business. And so it's really about like 20% of financial advisors that are women. And I'm hoping that improves over time, but um, I'm not saying all women need a financial advisor that's a woman, but I find that I've like just naturally attracted more women who are going through like life transitions and really need to speak to somebody about their wealth. Um, and they have like a comfortability with with dealing with other women. And I've also, you know, gone through a lot of those things myself. You know, I've I've been through divorce. I've had, you know, loss of loved ones and had to navigate all that comes with that. I've become a mother and I live multi-generationally with my aging parents. So there's just like, I feel like I, I've lived a lot of it that, that women carry and, and it shows up in our finances. You were sharing with me, and this was like a month ago, there was a lot of... Uh... New, new just information and statistics with regards to women and finances can you share those mm -hmm. with us as well yeah this study is um, a few years old now maybe like six or seven even but okay. they um there was a white paper that was done that was predicting that by about 2032 so you know not even 10 years away from where we are today that there's kind of this tide change happening where um wealth is kind of 50 50 in the hands of men and women today um, controlling that and it's predicted that within about 10 years that's going to be about like two-thirds one-third in the hands of women versus men because of generational changes transfers of wealth death divorce um, hopefully the investing pay gap and, and, and pay gap changing a little bit but when surveyed women all across the board, no matter how professional or educated or successful, only 3% of women identify as being part of their money conversation, in their household right now. So when you think about like 67% of them coming into all this wealth and only 3% being ready for that, I feel like that's like a huge gap that we need to close. And again, it's not because women are not capable or not smart enough. It's just that they're not part of that conversation right now. Do you have any thoughts? I, I know I do, but what do you think is contributing to having that statistic be so low? Oh, like, that seems so low <laughs> as being involved. There's, but, there's so many reasons. I mean, I think yeah. honestly, it starts really early in the life of a girl, which we could probably talk about that for a long time. But, <laughs> um, but like, you know, I think, pure socialization around like math and money and things like that contribute to it. Um, the CFP uh, Associ Association actually was trying to understand why they had only 20% again of their CFP candidates were becoming, um, uh, women were becoming CFP candidates. And what yeah. they found was that those women weren't as attracted to the financial services industry because they thought it was going to be so much math and formulas. And what you and I know is it's not really, it's relational. And it's like all these things that I think women have like a really specific superpower around. Um, but 
but they kind of opt out of that industry because they think it's very mathematical. And so like you and I know we use our software for so much of that stuff. We have amazing planning tools that help us, you know, really get to the heart of somebody's plan. We're not sitting here just cranking away at like Excel spreadsheets. We're really in the, in the relationship of each family. But I think it's probably those similar reasons that women aren't interested in managing their own money of like, oh, I have to be good at math or I have to like that to really be, be effective at that. And um, it actually has shown that most women have really strong intuition about things like risk and return and um, probably should give themselves a little bit more credit for um, their ability to do that. There's something that I do that I take a lot of pride in is I will send out both people in a relationship, husband and wife, the risk questionnaire for them to take on their own. Mm -hmm. And and I stress for them to take it on their own because it's not getting into any jargon. It's just saying, you know, um, would you feel comfortable with this or that? Yeah, this or that. It's kind of like an eye test for a little bit of it. But (laughs) um, and we all been through the optometrist and did the eye test, uh, you know, but uh, there's no wrong answer. It's how do you feel about Mm -hmm. risk and return? And uh, it's it, for me. It's so important that I understand both of their risk and returns. Yep. Right. And then, as a financial advisor, I look at what is their financial plan telling me how much risk I could take. So I have all the data yep. that I can need, and then explain it in a very easy and straightforward way. Um, but what I think it allows me to do more than anything is making sure that I am hearing the thoughts and the opinions of both people in the relationship, not just one. Now, you know, there's uh, there's a thing in our industry that we call a one-legged appointment. You know I'm familiar with what I'm talking about, Mm -hmm. right? (laughs) It is the most frustrating thing. Now, share with the audience, if you don't mind, like a one-legged appointment, and then let's talk a little bit, like let's gripe a little bit about why it's a little frustrating for us to have those appointments. And then like the things that's so important to avoid those one legged. Yeah. And are we talking specifically like when we're working with married couples? That's right. Yeah. Yeah. So when um, I find that in like almost all married couples, because opposites attract, right? Like, I don't know. I'm sure you find this in your own marriage. (laughs) There's always like one person who seems to be a lot more engaged around the finances than the other. And they tend to have like more opinions or more comfortability, like voicing all those opinions or their goals. And we kind of sometimes walk out of an appointment, like, wait, did we even hear like the other side of the equation? And, you know, we try to do a good job of like peeling back the onion, but um, either one of the spouses either again, doesn't feel competent or comfortable saying those things, or frankly, we have to be a little bit of a therapist, I think sometimes to like Mm kind of let people, um, feel like it's a safe space to air all of those things. Like one time, Jason, I, I had a couple who I could tell was like clearly uncomfortable, like having some tense financial conversation in front of an advisor, but I'm like, Hey, that's what I'm here for. You're like, let's take advantage of it. So I gave them a talking stone and I was like, you know, husband, you get to talk as long as you want while you have the stone in your hand, as soon as, you know, and wife, you just listen. But as soon as I turn over to her, you know, there's no interrupting. We have to do the same thing. And it was really interesting what came about because, but I had to kind of like, almost like force that upon them to avoid that, <laughs> that scenario. There was a, there's, you know, there's studies of uh, pay gaps and then that could create a savings gap. Can you talk to me a little bit more about that as well? Yeah. Yeah. I think a lot of us have probably heard about the pay gap, you know, that's still around and, and some people, um, you know, like to, poke holes in that data or like explain it away. But nevertheless, it is what it is. And that leads to things like savings gaps and investing gap, which I think is like the most important thing, because that really is the biggest determinant of like how well we are financially, like in the long term. Um, And also, I think women face some really interesting headwinds, like, you know, actuarially, like not to pick on you guys, but you, we still outlive you. Right. (laughs) And so true. If you're a married couple or a partnered couple, um, men usually have the benefit of having someone when they get ill or at at the end of their life who's like taking care of them and shortening their hospital stays and shortening some of like maybe their medical costs because of the beauty of that partnership. But if women are the, the last to pass, then like 
we need more care. We have more expenses. We don't have someone maybe at home that can necessarily take care of us. And so there's a lot of additional financial headwinds that we face with potentially less money. And um, what I like to do is like acknowledge that data and also let's not stay stuck in that narrative where like we feel doomed, you know, let's figure out the steps that it takes to make sure that you're really well taken care of as a woman and all your, all your needs are met. So I don't like to like stay stuck and like that will forever be the case, but like, let's, let's do all, all the things needed to make sure you're thriving. I'm thinking about those that I serve and just in the last two days, I, I'm, I was thinking about this, Katie, before we got on air. It was about 60% of the meetings were with my clients that are women who have went through a divorce and not mm -hmm. remarried or uh, lost a loved one. Yeah. That was just an event. Okay, I'm going to really get emotional in a moment because, you know, uh, one of the toughest parts of our job is like when we lose someone, when yep. they pass away. Yep, so true. And um, a lot of times it's the husband, a yep. lot. And my, my clients that I have had for a long time and when I met with both people in the meetings, at least once or twice a year. It didn't have to be every single conversation, but there was a special cadence. There was a certain cadence. When the event occurred, there was a peace of mind. They mm -hmm. they had someone to talk to and kind of, hey, uh, I don't know what to do. I don't want to deal with the finances, but we have bank accounts that need everything, right? Um. So what I'm kind of getting at is I've, 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 I've walked through and I held the hand of, of those going through this toughest time in their lives, um, going through this. And unless you work in an industry where you see this on a daily basis, you don't really understand. And the, a common theme that I hear, and Katie, I'm interested in your thoughts on this, on this as well, is, is one of two things. It's typically one of two things. One is uh, my husband told me uh, before he passed, stay the course, don't make any changes whatsoever. So that's what I'm going to do. Or the second one is my husband dealt with all of this. Yes, I joined the meetings with you, but I now have to learn a lot of what's going on because then it's all on me now to make the decisions. Mm -hmm. Do you typically hear the same responses or is there another response that you typically hear that you would like to share with us? I, will, I, I mean, I'm just trying to understand, really get your perspective on this. Yeah, no, it sounds like you're really tuned in from having to go through that. And I mean, as an advisor, like we all at some point have to walk people down that path. And, um, and it's also like an honor to be able to like have worked with someone for so long that they've, and they've trusted you for so long that you get to help them with you know, like the, either the next generation planning or helping their spouse and, and all of that. But um, the one thing I just wanted to point out that you've been really lucky with is that most widows, actually 70% of them choose to change their advisor because they, they don't do. feel connected to their advisor because maybe their spouse was like leading that relationship. And so if you're not doing a good job as an advisor, like you're not going to be able to even help that widowed person um, because they're probably going to leave you and like go find someone they feel more comfortable with. So it sounds like you've done a really good job with that. But yeah, I think there is like this desire, like, do I have to come up the learning curve on what we're doing here? So I think that's an opportunity for us to really shine in being clear, being grounded and being compassionate. Like we're also sharing in their grief process. It doesn't mean that we have to be like, um, you know, an emotional wreck in the meeting, but, um, you know, walking through that process with them and holding their hand. And I find that especially with things like divorce, where there's a lot going on legally and uh, emotionally in negotiations and, but this is true of death too. 
is that you really have to like go at that person's pace. Like what is the absolute most important thing that we need to do in this one meeting? And then like the next one and the next one, because it can get really, really overwhelming. So I think like being that grounding force and kind of meeting them where they are while still like, okay, this is like the one thing we have to do today. Um, that's what I found to be really successful, not just with like women, but just with, with facing grief, you know? So, okay. For those that are listening right now, if you know a woman or you are a woman, I'm asking you, Katie, like what, what is the next step? Like, what are some steps that women could be taking to take that path towards financial uh, literacy or just financial awareness you know what is that yeah. i want to make i'm not trying to find the 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 exact right word but try to get close as possible mm -hmm. right what is the step yeah i think talk to someone you can trust because you know that saying like when you know better you do better I actually don't believe that or else you and I wouldn't even have jobs. I don't think like everyone would just be like crushing it at their finances and they wouldn't need us. Um, but I think especially with women, like finding someone that you trust that you can speak plainly with and not ever feel like you're spoken down to and, and you can really be met where you're at on your journey is really important. So that could be said for anyone, but I find that especially important with women. Um, and so, finding someone you can trust to talk to about your finances and also finding systems where you don't have to feel like you have to be a slave to managing your money. Like a lot of women that I meet, we're holding like a million and one things in our families and our careers and all this stuff. And managing our money always falls to the bottom. Like this is true of even me. <laughs> like, I don't know if you heard at the beginning of this podcast, I'm working from home today. My twin girls are like, you know, babbling outside the door. Like, so managing money kind of just is not appealing at the end of the day. So it's like, how can we create systems for women where their money is totally on lock and they have something that's like continuously earning them money and helping them save and helping them invest where they can just touch it for like five minutes a week and know that they're taken care of. And that's what I want to do for women. So not to say that everyone has to work with me, but like, that's what I would hope women would get out of their, you know, investment relationship. I also believe community is such a powerful thing for everybody. But mm -hmm. like women who are in, interested in learning more about finances or just having a community that has maybe some finances involved, right? Mm -hmm. Can you share with us any communities or anything like that that you're familiar oh. with that would be good to kind of explore? Yeah, I'm actually starting a, a group for women who really want to start their wealth journey. This is for like high earning women who are not yet rich and they want to learn all the systems that like you and I are implementing with our, our clients who already have their nest egg. And that's starting on October 30th. It's called the money edit. And it's really like how women can kind of like organize and declutter and systematize their way into wealth. It's a four week course that I'm doing. And we're doing that in community because I feel like women enjoy learning alongside each other. And we also get a lot of like momentum and support together. So that's something I'm doing for um, like sort of a, a budding client base that I have of like young women who are really crushing it, but need to know what to do with their money now. And um, so you're welcome to reach out to me for that. And I'm happy to share my contact information um, about that. But community is, is huge. I mean, the, just knowing that we're going through the same struggles, like you probably hear as I do with the clients that you're focusing on, you hear like the same version of a problem over and over and over and over again. It's like a little bit different because everyone's life is a little different, but that's what I hear when I work with women one-on-one. -on -one. And I'm like, I love, like, let's just all come together and like tackle these issues together. So that's one of the things I'm working on right now. I think that's wonderful. Okay. We're going to talk more. I got way more questions for you, but how can someone reach out to you to engage you one-on-one -on -one or engage into uh, the community that you that you just talked about. What's the best way to get a hold of you? Yeah, my email is Katie or Katie Randall, so K R A N D A L L at PCIAWealth dot com. But if you want to check out my personal website where some of these offerings are going to be, that brand is actually called Mother Load Wealth. Um, it's not exclusively for mothers, but I really love like the double entendre between kind of this like 
origin of, of abundance and also a nod to women. And so it's motherloadwealth.com. And that's where you can find me. I love the name. That's great. <laughs> okay. Now, one of the things that you and I worked on, it was, uh, you had this just wonderful idea and then it, we just, I, I just, I, I've seen it make massive improvements on people's mm -hmm. financial lives. So you're making an impact here with my clients in the Charleston area, but we call it portfolio payday. Mm -hmm. I do see that as a way of decoloring. Can you share with us portfolio payday, what it is, how it works, but what is before any of that, like, what is the, what is the, what is the benefit that people receive like from mm -hmm. this and how does that help them declutter? I think that was a good word you used. Yeah. There's so many benefits, as you know, because you've seen this work. But what I find is that creating systems, like one of the reasons why you might hear a story about like a janitor who retires with like $8 million or something is because he's found a system to like very mindlessly and quietly and easily save money and invest it. And so the reason why people's, you know, 401k savings tends to be really effective is because of that like ongoing rain or shine, you're investing, you're not necessarily thinking about it, you just know it's doing its thing. And so portfolio payday, one of the benefits is that. But the other benefit is that you get accustomed to getting paid by your own investments, not mm -hmm. a company, not your business, not your real estate. It's like everything that you're receiving for your lifestyle is getting paid to you from your investment account. So you could like step away from your work, from whatever else you have going on and like really easily make that transition into retirement too. So it's like creating the system that makes you really wealthy while you're working and then also like stepping away with total ease of mind. So I have a client, her name is Emily. I do change the name to protect the innocent. Okay. Sure. <laughs> uh, uh, but she's in uh, New York City and she is working at a hospital and she's um, more on the executive side of the business. And we, uh, I work with her parents and uh, by way of introduction and do a multi-generational planning, we did portfolio payday. Uh, she went from saving like uh, $400 uh, a month uh, for long-term investments outside of her 403B now she's saving closer to fifteen hundred dollars a month, all because we created. Just how big that would be, right? <laughs> oh, I I did, you know me, right? But like I showed, like okay, here's what that looks like. Yeah. So you can, and I and I remember saying, because uh, she, uh, she's in her early. Uh, I she if, she, if she's listening, she knows I'm talking about her. Okay, <laughs> she's in her late twenties. But I'm going to say she's in her mid 20s because I don't want her to throw her shoe at me. Okay. But anyway, <laughs> what I'm getting at, Katie, is I said to her, okay, by the time you're 60, you could make a determination do you want to retire earlier than mm -hmm. 60 or still retire at 60, but more of a robust retirement? Right. And her first question to me was, well, I have more than my parents at that age. <laughs> So I loved it. I loved yeah. it. I have another client. Uh, she's in uh, Phoenix area and she has a job where she does set design. So it's really cool mm -hmm. what she does. Like she's yeah. so incredible in, in her craft. But there's three months out of the year where really she doesn't get paid because it shuts down. Production shuts down. Yeah. So unless she goes to another part of the country, right? It's one of those things. Yeah. We did portfolio payday. And it was the first time during those three months, she got a reoccurring paycheck right from her mm -hmm. investment account. Yep. It didn't skip a beat. It was one of those things that was just straight, uh, just set up and automated. And like just seeing her face in a virtual mm -hmm. meeting, just so excited. Like I got my paychecks. Yeah. Like, yes, you That's did. So right. Neat. Yeah, And we set it up where we just built up that emergency savings to account for those months of, I'll call it dry your income. So it, it really helped. Uh, two clients, boom, off the top of my head, 
that are going through, you know, just life decisions and things mm-hmm. that are going on. Yeah. I did have a client appreciation event in Scottsdale and I got to meet the boyfriend. Okay. Nice. I took a picture nice. of me and the daughter with the boyfriend and I have yet to send it to the parents, <laughs> but I'm going to say because I haven't met the parents in person yet. We've been yeah. working together for over six years. We've been working yeah. virtually because they lived in different states. Yeah. We're going to meet for the first time in November. So it's right around yeah. the corner. I'm really excited, but I'm going to show them that picture. Like I met your daughter <laughs> in Scottsdale before I met you here in person. Um, I'm just a massive fan of the organization and structure and the process of Portfolio Payday. And that was that was your baby. That was your idea. That was your thoughts. And like you articulated it to me and I'm like, this makes total sense. This is a cash management account that we focus mm-hmm. on the most basic functions, money in, money out. And what do we do with the difference? Yeah. It just sets it up and declutters. I never use that word declutter. I'm going to start <laughs> using that word. You declutter. can steal that. Yeah. I mean, I've seen this work for so many people, especially with unpredictable income or variable income. I mean, people that are still working and they get equity compensation a few times a year and they wouldn't necessarily normally have a strategy around it. I mean, it just works for all kinds of, uh, for all kinds of return uh, income streams and, and needs and things like that. And it's adjustable, but what I love about it most for like my own kind of selfish reasons as an advisor is that if a client's on portfolio payday and they're really using it the way it's supposed to, then I feel even more confident that their plan is like totally dialed in because we're not guessing about how much money they make. We're not guessing what their expenses are. We know exactly what it is. And I can see in real time their investing rate. So like, I know exactly that their financial plan is like completely dialed. And I feel even more confident when I tell them, you know, you can retire before 60. Um, Because sometimes we find out that when people retire, they spend a lot more money than they'll tell you or they even thought. And that gets really tricky, right? I had this couple, they, they were very, uh, budget focused from prior conversations. We did portfolio payday and, uh, we had in our financial plan spending around $70,000 a year. They spent 114,000. So I showed them, Hey, if you retire and you spend this much money, You would run out of money by the time you're 78. Yeah. So we got to look at a couple things. Do you want to delay your retirement to spend that much money? Do you want to lower your spending? (laughs) Right. What what it was. And it was, and they're like, there's no way we spent that much money. I'm like, that's how much money we sent out to you through our program. Yeah. I, I could, here's the report. And then they saw the data and they're like, okay, we're going to cut down our spending. Right. Um, and I go, okay, it's not going to happen overnight, but let's move in that direction. And then Mm -hmm. I'll update the financial plan as I see progress in that, you know, um, now I gotta say they came to the conclusion to lower the spending. They could have Mm -hmm. said, no, we want to spend more. And we just will delay our retirement. The choice was theirs, but I gave them enough information so they could make an informed decision on what route to go. Exactly. And that's the thing. It's not meant to be like a control mechanism at all. It's meant to be like, let's all be working off the same sheet of paper here. And also like, you know, get that clear, like, you know, clear picture. That's what we're talking about. Like get that completely clear picture before, way before you're going to retire because we don't want any surprises. And that's, those are like the details that I feel like is missed a lot in financial planning and advising is like that lack of detail leads to a half-baked financial plan, you know? Yeah. The, the, the biggest doors rely on the smallest hinges, a tweak here, Mm -hmm. an adjustment there. You pull this lever, you hit that button, big things can happen. Yeah. Good or bad, depending on what you're doing. Right. But it's, it's especially earlier on in, uh, and finances, the smallest adjustments can make massive impacts over time. And it's Mm -hmm. so important. 
you know, there's there's so many facets of women in finance. I know we got on the portfolio payday kick. This was not a portfolio payday infomercial. It was just something that Katie and I worked on behind the scenes right? for over but a year. But this works really well for women. You know, like they're they're like, hey, show me what to save, show me what to invest. Let's mechanize it. I don't want to have to look at it and micromanage it. And like we're off to the races and. You know, I've seen this work for women of like all ages, but especially people that are willing to harness that while they're still working. I mean, it's, it's just absolutely, I mean, it's massive what, what you can do. There is there is something I think would be important to talk about before we wrap up when it comes to women in finance is um, married couple, while they're married, married couple filing jointly going into retirement, they're at a lower bracket than a, a counterpart that's at a single filing bracket. And so what I'm showing a lot of couples is, okay, we do these Roth conversions. I'm not saying they mm -hmm. absolutely have to, it's not fits for everybody, but we do these Roth conversions. What that does is, is lower the overall tax implication on the financial plan. Now, if they happen to be at similar ages, and let's say I have them passing away at similar ages, mm -hmm. I just do a what if of, okay, what if, let's just say one of you, and I pick the man, right? I'm just, because I'm mean like that. I'm going to pick, I'm going <laughs> to pick on him. So I'm going to, I'm going to pick on you on this one. I'm going to have you pass away now, 84 instead of 91, right? If I don't, if we don't do the Roth conversions, the tax liability shoots mm -hmm. so high up because yep. The required minimum distributions is now done at a single filing bracket the year after. Right. Yep. Wow. And so you're paying all this money to Uncle Sam, and you're like, what am I having left? And this is where they're going, okay, where do I live? Who do mm -hmm. I live with? What do I do? I've been focusing on the health of my husband. Now what do I want to do now that I have this time to focus on what I want to do? Yeah. And it could be housing and retirement is such a an important thing and then tax planning especially on the surviving spouse mm -hmm. can you share with us me just talk to me on this one and no one else is watching or listening i only get one viewer and it's my mom okay but <laughs> hi, mom. we all say hi, hi mommy no. way to go raising jason <laughs> But what I'm getting—that was a shout out to my. Oh, but what I'm getting at, Katie, is what are some of the conversations you're having that could be really impactful for the women that are listening towards the end of their life, or, you know, the end mm -hmm. of their financial plan. But in the event that they lose their spouse, what are some yeah. of the things that you're doing in your practice to help them kind of go through this dialogue? And this conversation to show the importance of making a proactive decision, whatever that may be. For sure. Yeah. Yeah. There's so much that comes to mind, Jason, but I would say like, I heard this thing once in, a, in a, another woman's study about money and it stuck with me for a very long time, which is that at the very heart of it, all women, most women fear that they're just going to become like the proverbial bag lady. Okay. Do you know what I'm talking about? I have a client who says this to me, Jason, am I going to be a bag lady? I'm like, no, you're fine. Right. <laughs> yes. Right. She says it though. Really okay. pervasive. Okay. So like that, if you just think about like all your female clients, whether they're married or not, like in, in their little heart somewhere, they're worried about this happening to them. Right. And, and especially like when, I mean, if you've worked your whole career and you're single and you retire single, like probably still a fear, but certainly like in the wake of losing your, your husband or, you know, your, your uh, other half, like I could see how that could kick up a lot too. So I just wanted to share that with you for one, cause that's what always comes to mind. But yeah, I think, um, especially with women outliving men and us just like living longer in general, it definitely leads to a lot of conversations about, a few things. What do we want our legacy to be and how do we want to express that? So for some people, that's all about like their family and leaving the most or leaving it in like the most responsible way to like their kids and grandkids. For some people, it's like charitable strategy if that's really interesting to them because we can do that kind of stuff in a really high uh, impact way with, with taxes um, and, and do it fairly 
simply too. Um, yeah. I really like using donor advised funds and things like that to yeah. kind of get like double tax benefits. Um, but also I think about like taking care of ourselves. And, and so it's like, do we need things like long-term care? For a lot of people, they might be self-insured, but like, let's really stress test that to make sure that you are. And if not, there are some really interesting ways to go about long-term care. And there's like, I feel like way more, you could probably speak to it better than I can, but like way more options out there. Um, uh, yeah, for- long-term care isn't what it used to be. Yeah. Um, I can't stand what it used to be. It has definitely moved in the right direction over the last 10 years. Long-term yeah. care planning with the policies that are out there now versus what it was when I started over 20 years, oh, nearly 20 mm-hmm. years ago. My gosh, mm-hmm. uh, that's why you see this right here. Um, <laughs> uh, this was the 2008 bear market, 2012, right. 2018. <laughs> COVID's that's in what there. that was. <laughs> COVID is in there somewhere a little bit, but not my, not Ryan or Avery, my children. No, so I got to share this story. I think it's so important. So my wife, um, on Tuesdays, uh, her, she she would do this, or sometimes it would be her and her really good friend. They will make bouquets of flowers and take it to nursing homes. Mm-hmm. And during the holidays, I had some additional time off. And and so I was like, oh, I want to do this with you. Like, I, I shouldn't make a bouquet. <laughs> That's not my forte. But I could, I could, I help deliver them and carry it and all this other stuff, right? Yeah. And one of the boxes, they were like really small, like I don't even know what it's called, but smaller bouquets. And I go, why are they so small? She goes, we're going to a, a Medicaid facility. Mm-hmm. I was like, oh. Mm-hmm. So we go in there and we're delivering them to the to the residents. Mm-hmm. making sure that they were seen and heard and cared for. Yeah. And uh, she was right. Uh, like inside the Medicaid facility, there was uh, not a lot of uh, shelf space. So smaller bouquets. But they, yeah. she, but she made a really big one for the dining room, right? And so they got <laughs> to see those flowers. And we're, when we were leaving, they were like, I was like, is there anything else we could do? My heart's not at this point. I'm just like, what could we do? And they're like, they love blankets and and non-slip socks. I'm like, done. Right. We'll be right back. (laughs) We did that. But the other places that uh, Rachel would go to, my wife, Rachel would be like bigger bouquets because they had more of apartment style living Mm -hmm. and things of that nature. And I found that to be fascinating that I learned something by the size of flower bouquets that my wife was doing to give yeah. back to the community and let people mm-hmm. know that they're still seen and cared about. And right. I, and uh, she now has a pen pal that's 102 years old. Molly, if you're listening, we know <laughs> you. We love you in our household. Thank you so much for the wonderful notes that you send back to mm-hmm. us. But I got to share this other story, Katie. I'm, I'm a story. I'm a story. I, I love stories. Um, I went to Rise Up Kings. It's a it's a faith based organization for uh, men who own business businesses. Mm-hmm. But they also have Rise Up Queens, which is really cool. But uh, mm-hmm. I went to Rise Up Kings, and I hope they don't get mad at me for sharing this. We went to a uh, we went to a cemetery, and I had to write my own eulogy, as it mm-hmm. in the voice of Rachel. Oh wow. And it was wow. as if I pass away like then, right? Not in the future. Mm-hmm. Oh, Katie, uh, it was tough. And then, like in it, because I'm a financial planner, like thank you for the life insurance and stuff. Like that. <laughs> Jason's patting himself on the back. You're welcome. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for this. We can stay in the house that we raised our kids in, but you're not gonna walk Avery down the aisle right. and wow. you're not going to be there for our son explaining how to get over your first heartbreak <laughs> right? mm-hmm. and how to shave right. and, and things of that nature. And oh my goodness gracious. I mean, I, I, I couldn't wait to get home, give my wife the biggest hug kiss, and give yeah. my kids the biggest hug. Uh, because that eulogy, uh, I actually have it in a notepad, right? In reaching distance, I keep that notepad everywhere I go. 
they asked us to do a challenge, Katie, to write a new, uh, the, uh, another eulogy that your great grandchildren wrote for you in the event that you passed away at a hundred. Wow. I gotta say, it's so, it was such an impactful uh, experience. Um, but when I when I had to write it in Rachel's perspective, I thought of my clients that lost their husbands at early ages. Yeah. And what they would share with me in one-on-one -on -one conversations, right? I love that we're having this conversation as I hear your baby in the background ha like laughing and having fun and making some noise, right? They're, That's going to come they're through. They're not having a super fun time right now. <laughs> hey, that'll but... happen. That'll happen, right? From time but, to time. They'll work it out. But, but, yeah. I mean, um, wow. What a perspective <laughs> shifter there. And, yeah. you know, like. It, I think it kind of, I, I don't, I don't want to cut you off, but I like for no. me, it just highlights like, like it's so important what we do to help people make sure like their legacy really like lives on and, and reaches the people they want it to reach and takes care of the people that they care about. And also like, it's just so much bigger than that. And so money is certainly not the end all be all. All it does is like help us amplify who we are and, and what we want to do. Um, but like, you know, how do you, how do you put a price tag on something like what your great grandchildren are going to remember about you, you know? All I can say is what I, okay, I'm a financial planner. Okay. Don't hold this against me. But I looked at what my great grandchild wrote, a, wrote for me and what my wife wrote. And I looked at the gap and that's what I'm focusing on. <laughs> Philly, right. Uh, yeah. we call it the stop gap analysis, but that's just yeah. jargon. Nobody cares about it. I'm just looking at what's in the middle and seeing what I could do to move in that direction. And, uh, yeah. that's what, I, that's what fills my bucket. I love that. Well, this conversation filled my bucket too, Katie. I gotta tell you, I always feel like excited after talking with you. I know. Same. I'm going to go run, yeah. not a marathon, I'll, I'll, maybe a 5k. I'll do a 5k. <laughs> You feel refreshed after running a 5K? Good for you. <laughs> um, no, I feel excited talking with you, and then I could go run the 5K, but then after oh, that, I'm, okay. yeah, yeah, I'm laying on a couch or something. Like, there's okay. no, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, what is, what, uh, share with us again how people mm -hmm. could reach out, how women yeah. could reach out, or people in general could reach out to you and have a conversation. Or, or learn more about the community that you were referring to before. Yeah. What is your email, phone number, uh, social security number, address? No, I'm kidding. Uh, <laughs> how can I get a hold of you? I'm a Gemini. Um, no, I'm uh, so <laughs> probably fastest way to reach me is by email, and that's krandall at pciawealth.com because both Jason and I work for Prime Capital Investment Advisors. <laughs> And if you also want to hit up my website for my like women focused financial well being brand, that's motherloadwealth.com. And my cell is 503-929-7297. I'd love to hear from you. Folks, Thanks, you just had a chance to meet Katie Randall. Isn't like now you see why I thought this was so important so to bring her on a clear picture financial as a special edition to have such an important conversation with a leading advisor here at the firm talking about wealth and women it would be it would have been irresponsible if i didn't have katie come on and have this conversation with all of us thank you for tuning in thank you for listening and most importantly thank you for your most precious commodity which is your time this is Jason Noble as your host of Clear Picture Financial. Thank you so much. Thanks, Jason.